So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome back uh, to today. It is titled as Scheduling in Hard Real-Time Systems, the Response Time Approach. Uh, this is going to be given by Professor Paritosh Pandya, the former Dean uh, at School of Technology and Computer Science here for Mumbai. Uh, before I kind of formally introduce today's speaker, I would like to say a couple of uh, words about ASSET Colloquium. ASSET stands for Advances in Science, uh, Engineering and Technology. And uh, this is a, a forum uh, which is now more than about 40 years, almost about 40 years. And uh, every Friday at 4 p.m. we have colloquia organized in the on the topics that are largely, uh, you know, based on engineering and uh, technology topics, the software, medical technology, and popular science, and so on and so forth. And uh, of course, this colloquia complements the two more colloquia that happens at TIF, all at four four o'clock in the evening. One on Wednesday. This is called Natural Sciences Faculty uh, Colloquium, and the other one is uh, uh, on Thursday evening, which is mathematics colloquium. Um, so in fact, today's colloquium has some special significance. Uh, so I would like to kind of take a couple of minutes. I hope I'm not emptying uh, the speaker's uh, words on it. Uh, uh, so Paritosh and uh, his PhD supervisor, whom I'm also very happy to announce that he's here on the call, Professor Matai Joseph. Uh, in 1986, they wrote a paper, Finding Response Times at Real-Time System, uh, which is, uh, you know, which has won recently an award. It is called uh, Technical Committee, IEEE Technical Committee on Real-Time Systems 2020 Test of Time Award. And um, in fact, uh, this is very interesting because this is the uh, first time that this award is being given by the IEEE Technical Committee uh, for pioneering works that were cornerstones for the development of real-time system field and that uh, has left a lasting impact on the community. In fact, the qualification for having this award is the paper should be older than 10 years. And um, also, of course, maybe Parathos will again mention, but let me, I'm too excited to say this, uh, that uh, it's rather special probably for Parathos because this is the very first paper that he wrote along with his PhD supervisor, uh, Matai, as, the, as a PhD student at TIFR. Uh, so that is the background. And when uh, this particular announcement was made, I requested Paritosh uh, that, you know, why not you speak uh, about this award? And also, more importantly, the work that has gone by. In fact, there are four papers which were awarded uh, uh, at this time. So he's, he kindly agreed to kind of talk to us about uh, this particular field and how it evolved and, you know, what is the significance of this particular paper, etc. So that is so much on the background. Let me take another minute to formally introduce Paritosh for others who are from outside TIFR. Um, Paritosh, uh, area of interest, of course, include logic, automata, mathematics of program construction and embedded systems. Uh, as I said, he is a former Dean of School of Technology and Computer Science at AIFR. He is currently uh, an adjunct professor at the, uh, just give me a sec, uh, at the IIT Bombay. Uh, Paritosh did his BTEC in electronics uh, at MS University of Baroda and uh, MTEC from computer uh, science at IIT Kanpur and of course PhD in computer science at TIFR. Uh, he has worked as a research officer at the Oxford University Computing Laboratory under Professor C. R. Pura. Also as a visiting scientist at the United Nations University International Institute of Software Technology at Macau. Paritosh, uh, besides computer science, of course, loves Indian classical music and uh, uh, he's trying to teach the same to his computer. So, uh, in fact, uh, I must also share that uh, his, he gave his previous asset colloquium just titled Computer Vadan uh, on Computer Analysis and Synthesis of Indian Music uh, almost exactly 16 years ago. So that was uh, July 29, 2005. Uh, as I said, uh, we also have a special pleasure of having Professor Matai Joseph, the PhD thesis advisor of Paritosh. Uh, 
unfortunately i i don't know him personally well enough but uh, a little bit i thought i would say uh, mostly from wiki uh, so he was a fellow and senior research scientist at the kif for during 68 to 85 uh, and thereupon he went to university of oxford in england for almost 12 years from 85 to 97 but he returned back to india in 97 and he worked with uh, you know a few a very key industrial positions industry positions one as executive director of the uh, tata research development and design center at pune and also executive vice president at pcs uh, between 97 and 2007 um, in fact matai was the first person from india to be elected to the council of acm and uh, okay before that of course he held several visiting positions at many prestigious universities and uh, joseph is an author of digital research uh, a personal reminiscence that also uh charts the development of it in india uh, and the issues involved uh, i'm sorry if i uh, gave any incorrect information about professor matai joseph uh, but i would like uh, to take this opportunity on behalf of all of us including of course today's speaker uh, to request matai to say a few words uh, before passing on the uh, mic to paritosh okay thank you thank you very much um it's it's an unusual situation to be uh thinking about a paper that was written more than 35 years ago and trying to remember what uh, put it together you know what interested the uh, what made us get interested in the topic how many failed attempts did we have and uh what was the final one which seems to have been uh, fairly successful uh but i leave paritosh to tell that part of the story uh one thing i thought i should mention is that uh computer science unlike the natural sciences unlike mathematics for example which is not a natural science uh the phenomenon that we study are based around computer systems uh that's where we find uh, the uh, phenomena and some of them are of interest uh of great interest and uh often it's a question of uh saying has anyone looked at this before the connection between a and b or uh does this question have an answer and uh, sometimes there is uh, of course a good answer and sometimes there is not and this was really one of those situations uh in say 1984 or so uh, there seemed to be no very good answer to this question uh based around this one premise if computers were fast enough would there be a real time problem uh and uh, dijkstra who was the sort of oracle of uh, computer science in those days uh, and for years after that he put this question out and uh, didn't wait for an answer and walked away and left it hanging in the air there uh, there was a lot of previous work but I should tell you about it uh but this was an intriguing question uh one more point i will make that um, as we were thinking about this in the early uh, 80s uh, i had to go to barc for some interviews and we were interviewing people for promotion to something to something else i've forgotten exactly what uh and there was a, a young man there very competent looking man and he uh i asked him what he was doing and he was building multi channel analyzers and they had got to 64 channel analyzers and he said they couldn't get to 128 channel analyzers because the processor was not fast enough so i said uh, how do you know that when you get this new intel processor it will be fast enough he looked at me with a little smile and said you know we've been in this business a long time we know these things and that also seemed to be uh, not a very satisfactory answer he probably did know quite a lot but it wasn't the scientific answer and uh, so these things came together and began being a little irritant uh, in the sense that you w- woke up at night and thought about this you read about it and uh, then slowly the ideas evolved so i leave paritosh to tell you the rest of the story Uh, and the background surrounding it uh, and i will also listen with great interest because uh, as i said it's 
over 35 years since we visited that territory uh, together. Over to you, Paritosh. Uh, thank you, Mathai. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So it's indeed a great pleasure uh, to be back at the IFR, albeit virtually, to give this talk back among friends. You know, currently I am in IIT Bombay, uh, having retired from TIFR, but I spent larger part of my working life at TIFR, and uh, it is indeed a great pleasure to be back uh, again among friends. It's as uh, Satyanarayan said, uh, you know, it's all the more pleasure because today's topic takes me back to, right to my initial days in TIFR as a PhD student under Matai and brings back very pleasant memories. And uh, uh, so uh, thank you TIFR, thank you Satyanarayan for giving me the opportunity. Now uh, I'm going to talk about uh, schedulability in real time systems, which has been a troublesome problem for many years. There has been substantial progress, but the problem in another form still keeps surfacing. So it's worth uh, 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 probably looking at. What happened was that uh, IEEE Technical Committee on uh, uh, Real-Time Systems recently instituted uh, a test of time award, you know, looking back at, you know, specific works, not lifetime work, but specific papers, and, you know, which had made some mark on the field continued to make mark on the field and try to give them some sort of test, test of time awards. Now, many conferences in computer science are doing this sort of introspection. And this is the first one for real time systems. Uh, and they recently announced, uh, you know, chose four papers. And uh, one of them was, uh, uh, you know, the work done at the IFR way back in uh, uh, 86. So we thought we will take this opportunity to survey not only what was in that paper, but in all the papers which are from roughly that era and uh, try and do a retrospective on that line of work. Uh, that is what I thought I would do today. So Mathai already touched upon the nature of our subject. I'll go through this very fast. But you know what do computing? Uh, what what does computing science involve? I don't call it computer science because computers have as much to do with computer computing science as telescopes have to do with uh, uh, astronomy. This is a, again a quote from Dijkstra. He could be quite acid. Okay, so what we one of the things we do in computing science is we develop algorithms, which is step by step methods of calculation to solve a problem. Now, this has been an enterprise that has been there, uh, you know, with mathematicians, with scientists for ages. For example, there's this Euclid's algorithm for GCD calculation. You have two pair of natural numbers. You subtract the smaller from the larger and keep doing this. Uh, remove the larger and keep the difference. Keep doing this till both numbers become equal, at which point you found GCD, right? So you develop algorithms to solve problems and you, uh, uh, and the next thing you do is you try to automate the execution of these algorithms because you, you know, then the calculation is pretty mechanical. You want to leave it to machines to perform the steps of calculations automatically. And this has been a theme which has interested who's who of, uh, you know, uh, 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 intelligentsia and some to, to just drop some names. Earliest machines were designed by Pascal. It, it, it was called Pascal lane, which could add and subtract. Then Leibniz, who designed uh, integral calculus, went on to design a machine which could not only add and subtract, but could also multiply and divide. Lord Rayleigh designed a special purpose computer to calculate uh, insurance premium. I used to work with actuaries department. And he actually defined, you know, designed a machine to compute actuarial tables because that was a day and day of use. Charles Babbage went on and uh, introduced the idea of programmable computers. See, before that, all computers were special purpose computers for special, one fixed computation. If you wanted to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit, you would design a new computer, special hardware for that. And Babbage freed us of that. He said, there would be one kind of computer and you could give it something called a program. And you know, to change its behavior depending on the program that you gave and calculate what was to be uh, calculated as given by the program. So there were those computers, and then you know, computers evolved from then 
Von Neumann introduced the idea of, ele of using electromechanical relays to do computation using Boolean logic. Uh, Von Neumann went on and introduced the modern architecture of computers. Uh, Turing was involved in this. And since then, the computers have grown and grown. And modern computers are extremely intricate devices. You know, if you look at your, uh, the, the computer on your laptop, you know, it already has several cores. It has got several levels of caches. The processor is really high powered with, you know, instruction parallelism, pipelining, hyperthreading, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, so I won't go into it, but machines are complicated. As if this was not enough, we use GPUs on our video cards, which we can use, and uh, digital signal processing chips on our sound cards. And all this comes inside your mobiles and these things. Uh, we use machines which are grids and clusters. So computing has really grown and now it is really able to solve problems in large scale. In fact, they are getting, it is envisioned that they're getting ubiquitous. They'll be there in every sphere of life. That is because computers are being augmented with sensors. So they will be able to sense the environment. They will communicate with each other using computer networking and using artificial intelligence, they will get some autonomous behavior. So we're going to have this massive internet of things with autonomous computers, which are sensing the world. And this is going to give us smart everything, you know, not only smart homes and smart transports and smart energy, but e-health and e-education. And if you look at the current list of, you know, grand challenges for engineering, you know, this kind of computing plays a very large uh, part. So it is important that we understand this world of computers and their use you know, by programming uh, solutions on top of it. And we need science in order to do that. Now, as I outlined above, there are two, two main aspects to this. First is the science of algorithm design and analysis, because ultimately, you know, the, for every problem, we want to find out a method of solution. And uh, this is a very mature field. The IFR is a very active group on algorithm design and analysis now. Uh, and I think I will not say too much about it. I mean, you should definitely have an asset colloquium on that there. But the other part is having developed this algorithm, you know, you want to develop, you know, solutions, you know, which make a use of these algorithms to solve real world problems. And for that, you write software and software and computing systems at large are amongst the most complex artifacts designed by mankind. You know, your Windows operating system has over 70 million lines of code. This is a figure I heard a few years ago. Your word processor is over 3 million lines of code. Your TV has over 20 million lines of code. You know, these things are huge and complex. So modern, and they are not, you know, some sort of enormous activity, you know, some sort of crystal lattice of statements. These are highly organized, highly complex objects. So modern software is a highly structured and complex conglomerate of concurrent hierarchical and interacting components, which is designed to serve specific purposes. And design of such software is, is, is challenging. Next, having developed such a, such a software, we need to deploy this on modern computing systems. And this modern computing systems are extremely complex. You know, you've got grids, you've got clusters, you've got multiple processors, you've got special purpose processors. And, uh, you know, you want to do some sort of principled uh, deployment of complex software systems on modern complex computing machines. And this is a big challenge. And finally, because computers are being used in all spheres of life, some of them, you know, both economically and in human terms, very sensitive, we better be sure about our design. So there is need to reason about correctness of such designs and deployments, you know, and there's a whole field called formal methods and model checking, which deals with this aspect of computing system correctness. In fact, TIFR was an early entrant in this in uh, India and Mathai and Shamsundar, I think, led this group, this activity in, in, in TIFR. So we're very privileged to have Mathai here. Uh, now, because of all these challenges, Sifakis, the Turing Award winner, has been advocating in uh, last several years that we need not only a science of algorithm design, but a science of computing systems. It deals with structures of the program, deployment of these programs on computing machines, and the correctness of this. And some of the components of this software will make use of algorithms which have been 
there, but there is more to software than just algorithms. That is what he says. And in helping us deploy software on systems, we use lots of system software. These are programming languages, compilers, operating systems, network protocols, and the list goes on. So TIFR, of course, was an early player in India uh, at the forefront of computer system design in India, definitely. And the active, you know, this is the period spanning 1950 to 90. Uh, there was TIFRAC, the first digital computer, you know, uh, of India. It seems that Nehru had heard, I mean, after Turing's work on, uh, you know, use of uh, Enigma in breaking codes, you know, computing went underground, but it was considered strategic technology. And Baba, I have read somewhere that Baba had heard of this as a strategic technology, and he put his two foremost generals to develop computing in India. Manu Lopez went on you know, at ISI to develop uh, India's first analog computer. And Baba, lay, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, basically said a digital computer should be uh, made at TIFR and TIFR went on to make TIFRAC, the first digital computer. Uh, the work didn't stop there. Uh, the, the design of computing systems uh, and the related uh, software went on at TIFR. In fact, TIFR was accorded the status of National Center for Software Development and Computing Technologies, and a large number of machines were designed. This included, for example, the, the Indian uh, clone of PDP-11 machines manufactured by ECIL, and I think TIFR had a role in designing some of the early versions of these TDC computers. And probably we consulted, but Mathai could be able to say a bit more about it. At the same time, we were at TIFR was also in, uh, experimenting with state-of-the-art systems uh, uh, design technologies. So there were, you know, multiprocessor operating systems. There was a programming language to write such an operating system, a compiler for this. And you know, these were competing with state-of-the-art there. So I think Mathai was leading most of the CCN and multiprocessor operating system uh, effort and this kind of thing. There were other computing things, at just C dot param. So I, what I would say is between 50s and 90s was the golden era of, uh, you know, uh, science of computer uh, system design and analysis uh, in uh, TIFR. And the current work actually happened during this period. I happened to join uh, uh, NCSD city TIFR in 1982. And uh, I was put into all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, the current paper that we're going to discuss came out of this. So the work I'm going to talk about deals with embedded systems. What are embedded systems? Embedded systems are an assembly of electromechanical, optical, chemical components, all you know, connected and controlled by an onboard computer. So the simplest example is your washing machine. There's a little microcontroller there. And then you know, there, are, there are valves and there are motors to control the spinning and uh, there are pumps to pump water. And uh, you know, there are sensors to change, check the chemical composition of the water, how dirty it is and what is the kind of adaptation you want to do to the washing cycle. And there's a computer which is continuously sensing all these devices and controlling them. So, so this is the broad nature of, uh, uh, you know, uh, an embedded system. And typically a program in an embedded system is organized as a set of what are called periodic and sporadic tasks. So each task is responsible for doing one thing. For example, there could be one, you know, if you have a self-driving car, there could be one task which could be, you know, looking at the LiDAR sensor to detect all the obstacles in 3D in front of you, create a kind of 3D map of the world outside you. Another task could be, you know, taking that up and uh, creating, planning a path through that. And then there would be a task which would be controlling the, the speed and the uh, direction of movement of the car together with braking and engine control and all that. So, you know, there would be many, many tasks, they would interact and they would, they would work uh, at least conceptually simultaneously. So periodic task typically has the following structure. You know, it is repeated every once in a while at some, some uh, period like 10 milliseconds, let's say. And what it does is in each period, it would sense the input. It would then do computation required. So the sensing input could be sensing the, the uh, you know, using LiDAR, the obstacles in front. Compute would be computing the path through this uh, map of obstacles. And then actuation is based on that computation. You will actuate the motors which are driving the wheels of the car. 
you know and also the steering and the brakes so this is a typical structure periodic structure of uh, the task and uh, one thing that is characteristic of such programs is that there are stringent real time requirements on delays between the inputs and the outputs so you know if the lidar senses an obstacle and you know it takes a long time to compute the path through those obstacles and gives the correction to the steering and uh, speeding of the car let's say you know uh, minutes after sensing the obstacle that is too bad the car will crash so there are time limits as to how fast the output of the computation should be produced in a in an embedded system program in a real time program right so so to to justify that this is the structure of a of an embedded system typical structure of an embedded system let me give you the example of mars pathfinder this is part of the nasa mars mission in 97 where they sent a lander which landed on the mars and then the the rover the pathfinder separated from it and it explored the you know the the conditions on mars you know so this is the design of that you can see that unit has got some material adherence experiment uh, uh, at the back there is an extra x-ray spectrometer there's a solar panel and an associated system which does the power management because power is critical in you know such an environment there is an antenna for communication which lets it communicate with the lander there is the, of course the the uh, you know the mobility system the 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 motors you know which will make this move and at the front there are cameras and lasers to sense the the conditions you know uh, in front so that the rover can be steered uh, autonomously to move now if you this is the actual picture of the rover right and uh, internally it would look like this that there would be an onboard computer you know and uh, there would be this cpu which is an ibm rs 60000 there are two buses there is vme bus and there is a there is a bus called uh, mi1553 and all the devices on both the lander and the uh, pathfinder are connected via this bus to the computer and this would uh, involve you know control of the thrusters valves sun sensor star scanner and uh, for the lander it would have things like accelerometers gyros uh, you know things like that so this is the structure of a thing like mars rover and this mars rover program you know it would work around a, a real time operating system called vx works and uh, you know the thread which would control this bus communication you know which was the central one of the central components were organized as a periodic tasks and there were in fact three periodic tasks each executed at about 1/8 of the second okay and this three tasks were there was an information bus so you know this information bus was was involved in high speed communication between all the devices including the computer connected to the uh, you know interconnected and what it would do is you know it would push this information around rearrange the buffers you know it will do all kinds of optimization it will be responsible for fast transfer of information on the bus there was a communication thread which once in a while after forming an image or something you know a video will try to transmit it uh, you know over the bus uh, to the antenna system and to the lander and there was a weather uh, thread which would sense data about the current weather you know and it would pass this on and there is this three threads now the information bus and the weather thread uh, sort of communicated with each other i mean they 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 shared uh, you know common data you know some data would be passed on by the weather thread to information bus and information bus would be giving acknowledgments and things like that while the communication thread worked on its own okay so basically we had three periodic tasks the information bus thread which was the bus manager and it worked at high frequency with high priority it had to finish its activity very fast so it was given very high priority you know and uh, it worked at high frequency the communication th uh, thread worked at medium frequency and medium priority it had very long execution times so you know it needed very large amount of cpu time to finish its task and then there was weather thread which was geological data low frequency low priority and uh, you know the whole system worked with this now unfortunately this device you know after working for some days failed 
and the failure was largely because of the the operating system uh, you know which was organizing this different task and giving resources like computer memory and the computer cpu to them and we are, today's talk we'll have something to to talk about this one and you know so we're going to talk about the science which will try to analyze systems like this and try to make sure that you know bugs of the kind that happened on the mass uh, pathfinder don't happen as it turns out they debugged this uh, uh, problem and they corrected the program and uploaded it to the rover and the rover started working again in a couple of days okay so with that much introduction let me so this kind of work that i I'm going to talk about falls under what is called you know analysis of hard real time system and i'll introduce the model but uh, recently what happened was as as uh, satyanarayan said you know ieee started uh, introspecting and has started giving out what are called test of time awards you know for work which has uh, uh, influenced the field uh, uh, in some you know in some way and continues to have some sort of lasting impact on the field and four papers were chosen as a first slot you know they said papers older than uh, 10 years will, will be taken but you can see that you know in the inaugural round they chose papers which are very old our, our paper from tifr is one of them it is 35 years old but you and layton paper is around 10 12 years older than that so you know these are these are these are these go to the beginning so what i thought i would do is i would take up ideas from all of these papers and give you a retrospective on this that is what is my ambitious plan now let's see how it goes okay so so the kind of modeling of such systems such as this pathfinder uh, computation with periodic task you know a, a, a mathematical model to capture its characteristics was given by lu and leland in 73 which is the first paper in that list okay and it defines something called the hard real time system so what is a hard real time system your 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 computation consists of a set of periodic tasks tau1 to tau n and each task tau y the i th task is characterized by three numbers something called its period and this says how frequently the task repeats so you know between two invocations of this task this task must come again and again you know it's like sense uh, the obstacle do course correction and then drive the steering and the speed again do it few milliseconds later so the task kept get uh, are repeated uh, you know uh, 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 periodically and tau i gives the minimum period between two invocations so the invocations are not expected to be more frequent than this okay but maybe they occur you know more slowly okay each invocation requires certain amount of computation to be done and you must estimate how much of time you know the each task will take on the processor on board processor and you know of course with different inputs it may take different time but what you do is you estimate what is called the worst case execution time w set and this is what is called the computational load so this basically this this value says you know that task each invocation of task ti takes at most ci seconds of processor time and there are well known methods now which will allow you to profile your code and come up with this number finally you know the tasks execute on a single processor so you know although there are this n tasks which are uh, running periodically you have only one computer and somehow this computer is fast you must it must the single computer must somehow divide its time to do the activities of all these tasks so cpu is shared between tasks and uh, to give you an idea of that let me go to the next slide so here i have two tasks t1 first one has period 2 and the computational load is 1 so every 2 seconds it will require 1 uh, second worth of compute time whereas the second one has got period 5 every 5 seconds it needs 2 units of compute time right and the first task repeats every 2 seconds now here i have asked task to arise exactly at 2 seconds but maybe some task can be slower right now now you know secondly the second so the the red up arrows denote the the times of arrival of the task or the time of invocations of the task first row is for the task t1 tau1 and for the second row is for the task t2 now what the scheduler or the operating system does is in response to a task arriving it will gives cpu to one of those tasks to execute for some amount of time 
so you know he, and that decision about which task we will execute is based on priority so you know tasks are assigned priority and a task with higher priority will uh, uh, always execute uh, you know as compared to a lower priority task so you know for example you know uh, the first tau 1 task arrives at time 0 also tau 2 task arrives at time 0 but both of them cannot execute on the processor so the processor is allotted to the higher priority tau 1 task which executes for one unit of time which is what it needs and then it gives back the processor which is then given to the second task which runs for it requires two units of time to execute it runs for one unit of time but by then you know the second instance of the first tau one task arises so the processor the first ta second task is interrupted left halfway and the processor is given to the first task which runs for one time unit again the processor becomes free and then the second uh, 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 task continues and it finishes at this point so you can see that the first task is invoked at time zero and it finishes at time four so for the first invocation the response time for the second task is four when the second invocation occurs it so happens that the cpu was free during that slot and it runs for one time unit then it is forced to give up the processor which gets taken away for one time unit and that it executes so for the second invocation the response time is three seconds and the worst case response time for this and then the state of affairs repeat so the worst case execution time for the second process is four because it's worst of three and four for the first process it is the response time is one because it's the highest priority task and as soon as it it, it is it arrives it is given the cpu and it requires one time unit of execution so this is fine now if we change the priority you know to give higher priority to tau 2 or oh, I, I have a misprint here tau 2 has higher priority than tau 1 then what happens both tasks arrive at time 0 the second task starts executing because it is higher priority now there is a mistake here okay this should be less than okay so it runs for two time units and the first task you know which had deadline of one time unit is missed because it doesn't get any cpu for first two time units so this is not a valid execution because some deadlines of the first task are getting missed this was a valid execution because all the deadlines given here are being met so you know the way you assign priorities to tasks affects the response of the task and this is how systems execute uh, this kind of execution is called preemptive scheduling where the idea is the following this is called priority based preemptive scheduling where tasks are assigned unique priorities and invocation or arrival of a higher priority task switches the processor to is from a currently executing lower priority task this is how the processor is allocated between them and uh, the aim is to somehow assign priority given this mix of uh, task set you know to assign priorities to the task so that the deadlines are never violated no matter whatever is the arrival pattern of the task here i've had a very fixed pattern of arrival of task but there is some uncertainty here you know tasks can arrive a bit later they may require a little less computation time so you know priority assignment is called feasible if all possible task arrival patterns uh, uh, for all possible patterns of task arrival all deadlines are always met you know and the aim of design of such a system is first to model your real time system as such set of periodic tasks and then to assign priorities and modern operating systems will give if you do that modern operating systems will give you facilities to execute them on processors so you know operating system like vx works will uh, let you execute this okay now lu and leyland defined this model but uh, there were these questions you know and they posed two questions one was that of feasibility that suppose you assign priorities to the task can we check that this priority assignment is feasible that is for all possible task arrival patterns and for all compute loads that they come with of course subject to the constraints given uh, that all deadlines will always be met that is you will finish your computation before the deadline each invocation of the computation before the deadline so is the given priority assignment feasible uh, you know feasible 
that is the first question there is and the second question there is was given a task set how to assign priorities to task so that it ensures feasibility this is called the priority assignment question and these two questions are at the heart of analysis which is done for much more complex models even today so these are the two things that you try to do how to assign priorities to task because priority is a natural mechanism to schedule tasks and uh, uh, of course here we are talking about static priority scheduling each task is assigned a fixed priority at design time you know we'll see some variations but this is it so how to analyze both feasibility and priority assignment how am i doing for time yeah okay maybe we are not too bad uh, okay so the first cut to the problem that you this is all lewin leland paper the first in this list of you know four to be to be awarded i don't know where i lost it sir uh, uh, where i lost it uh, uh, yeah the first one uh, sorry this okay the first bob bullet okay they did all this and they really set up the field so you know we owe a lot to them you know uh, they posed these two questions and then they started analysis so first thing they defined was something called critical instance that there is all this uncertainty in the pattern in which the tasks arrive and the amount of computational load they bring but let us plan for the worst what is the worst situation that can arise so they said given a task set tau 1 to tau n with this characteristics let us say that all tasks are invoked simultaneously at time 0 that is you start the system with full demand you know everybody wants to run right at time 0 they are all perfectly synchronized to start wanting to do their thing in the beginning they are all full steam guys okay this is bad for the processor you know it will have a hard time meeting the response because it has to satisfy everything secondly tasks arrive exactly after period ti as in my example this thing at period 2 and the task after time 0 was arriving exactly at 2 and after 2 exactly at 4 it could have arrived later but it puts maximum demand by arriving as early as possible to give more load to the system uh where were my yeah okay so tasks arrive exactly after period ti and each task invocation takes have puts the maximum permitted load ci on the cpu right so this is the kind of worst case scenario for for uh, meeting the deadlines and if you fix a priority assignment the critical instance gives a unique behavior so now all this uncertainty about how the behavior unfolds is gone this is the worst that can happen and this is the one that you want to analyze and what you uh, and leland proved as their first theorem was that if under the given uh, priority assignment critical instance gives valid execution that is all deadlines are met you know in the critical instance then priority assignment is feasible that is all possible patterns of arrival of inputs and loads will also meet the deadlines so you reduce the problem of you know designing feasible priority assignment to analyzing only the critical instance this is the first okay this will be very useful next what they said was look we will give you some way of assigning priorities to the tasks okay and of course the aim of assigning priorities to the task was uh, that they will meet all the deadlines they didn't really satisfy that but they still prescribed some way of assigning tasks uh, priorities and the first method was what was called rate monotonic priority assignment or rate monotonic scheduling and it works only for the case where the deadline is same as the period that is you don't have a deadline you say that before the next invocation of the task i should finish my computation time this is the uh, you know sort of liberal assumption they made and under that they, they said that you should assign priorities in the order of the rates of the task that is inverse of the periods of the past the task so a task with shortest period gets the highest priority the, the most frequently recurring task gets the highest priority and the task with lowest period a uh, uh, longest period gets the least priority and then they prove that this rate monotonic scheduling is optimal so what is the meaning of optimal if you know you cleverly assign find a priority assignment which is feasible and that assignment is feasible so it meets all the deadlines if there exists such a clever assignment then my rate monotonic scheduling will also be feasible it will also meet all the deadlines so i am doing my best effort if anybody can meet the deadline so can i but i don't know whether you know even after rate monotonic scheduling i will meet the deadline or not 
So there was a loose end here. So they proved optimality, but they did not solve the feasibility question. Subject to feasibility, they found the optimal schedule. Now here there was this uh, assumption that uh, the deadline is same as the period, and that was removed uh, uh, almost 12, uh, 15 years later by Lung and Whitehead, who defined something called deadline monotonic scheduling. Let's keep it in uh, favor of time. Okay, so Liu and Leylert solved one of those two problems. They gave a priority assignment, but they did not ensure feasibility. They conditionally ensured feasibility. They said that if it is possible to meet feasibility, then this priority assignment will be good. This is optimal amongst them. But you can't send, send a lander, you know, hoping that there exists a priority assignment and I've chosen the best. Maybe there is no feasible assignment and your lander will not be able to meet deadlines and will fail. So, you know, there is a big gap here between this technology and feasibility. It solved half the problem, but the problem of feasibility was open in the theorems that I have presented you so far. I mean, Liu and Leyland founded the field. They were not unaware of the problem. So, in fact, they started making some progress towards feasibility. And for checking feasibility, they started looking at something called utilization. And in utilization, suppose there is task i, you know, which has a period tau i. And for each invocation, it requires ci units of processor time. So, you know, within tau i units, you know, it is occupying the processor for ci units of time. So, the ratio ci by ti gives the fraction of the time for which task i is capturing the CPU. And that, that story, you know, continues over long duration because the periods repeat. So, basically, uh, the utilization of task i, ci by ti, gives you the percentage or the fraction of the time for which that task I loads the CPU. Is this clear? Straightforward, right? Yes. If my, my, my period is two and for each invocation of the task, I require one unit of CPU time. Every two time units, I have to consume one time unit of CPU. So I, my, you know, I'm keeping the CPU busy for 50% of time and my utilization is 0.5. And if I consider all possible tasks, and I sum up the utilizations of each of them, I get a figure called U, which gives the total fraction of time for which my whole task set is keeping the CPU busy. So my utilization is this formula. And it gives a percentage of time or fraction of time for which the CPU is kept busy by the tasks. Okay? And what a natural obvious condition is that U should be less than one less than or equal to one. If you know you require more time than 100% of time of CPU, then there's no way you can meet it and you're going to miss the deadlines and you're going to miss processing some of the periods adequately. So, you know, this condition is a necessary condition. You know, that utilization should be at most one. So given a task mix, first thing you check is that the utilization is at, uh, you know, uh, less than one, equal to one. Now this condition is necessary for feasible scheduling, but not sufficient. There are task mixes where U is less than one, and yet there is no priority assignment which will meet the meet the deadlines. Okay. So how can we be sure? And actually, Lou, all this is also Lou and Dylan work. You know, same paper goes on to do all this analysis, and they also came up with a sufficient condition. They said that if my utilization is upper bounded by this formula where n is the number of tasks you know this right hand side if you as n increases tends to natural log of two you know about 70 percent so if my utilization is less than 70 percent of time then i am guaranteed that rate monotonic scheduling will meet all the deadlines so i just have to to you know load my cpu less I should maybe let CPU time go waste for 30% of time, and then I'll guarantee that all the deadlines will be met, right? Again, this is a sufficient condition. If it is met, all deadlines will definitely be met, but there are instances where this condition is not met, and yet it is possible to assign a priority assignment which will meet all the deadlines. So the big question was, is there a necessary and sufficient condition? you know, for feasibility of a task miss under a given priority assignment. Is there an exact test for feasibility? This was the question. And there was a lot of paper, lot of papers. I think 
Mathai had a go at this several times too. And I think the dominant theme was that somehow refining this condition on utilization, narrowing the gap between necessary and uh, sufficient condition on you, and you will get your answer. And there are more and more elaborate conditions, tightening the necessary condition and the sufficient condition. Okay, uh, from uh, natural log of two, they have moved to square root of n. I think. Okay, uh, but uh, you know we. at some point took a very different approach what is called the response time approach and he this is here where being a research scholar fresh out of college helps a lot you know nothing you know for you one approach is as good as another and there wasn't much of this response time approach although the goal was to make sure that you know response time of all the tasks must be less than deadline there was no systematic looking at this response time and we started abandoning the 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 utilization based approach and focus to response time approach so what and in fact what is called the worst case response time for a task so what is the worst case response time of a task you know worst case response time of a task will basically be you take the given priority assignment you know take the critical instance and find out the worst case response uh, time across invocations you know for the unique run that arises so this is the worst possible response time that can arise in the critical run for that task and hence it's the worst response time that can arise in any possible run you know in the worst situation in some lucky cases you may do better than this but this is the worst that can arise and you have to plan for the worst because you know your lander is going to mars and you have no time to you know reset the system or if your plane is flying and it fails you cannot bring it down while it's failing and repair it you know this these are not uh, fail stop systems okay so 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 rti is the worst case response time and what we said is let us look at the behavior of this worst case response time entity rti because after all your goal of design is to make this rti less than di the deadline you know the worst case response time should be less than the deadline and hence every response time is less than deadline right so let for a task i let hpi denote the set of all the tasks who have been assigned higher priority than i okay the then what we after some analysis arrived at is this equation it says that rti which occurs on both sides of the equation satisfies this equality and it's not very difficult to see okay so what it says is i let me explain this a little bit because this is the key equation and the key contribution to the field from our side and you know continues to be used you know in some form with some enhancements even today so consider the task 1 which is the highest priority task so there are no tasks of the set of tasks of, of priority higher than it is empty and this summation is zero because there are no further higher priority tasks you are considering the first task so this entity is zero and the response worst case response time of the highest priority task is same as its computational load and that's clear whenever the task arrives it gets the cpu it works for the load that it has which is ci and that is when it finishes nobody else can interrupt it so its response time is ci so this works for the highest priority task let's say zero a uh, one but situation is more interesting for the next task and further tasks you know so consider the task with priority not highest priority but the second highest priority a task like this its period is 5 and you know after some analysis let us say that magically we find out what is the response time and that turns out to be 4 but then that 4 will satisfy this equation that is what we are claiming so if the response time is 4 what happens during this time period 0 to 4 firstly you know the higher priority task is invoked how many times you know i have the total duration of this interval is 4 and my period of the higher priority task is 2 you know it is tj you know i have my period of so the higher priority priority task is 2 and my response time is 4 although my period is 5 so i will have two invocations of the higher priority task before i meet my response okay 
before i finish my response i will have two invocations of the higher priority task and each of those invocations will put a computational load of one you know whenever the higher priority task arises i run this system for one time unit this green is one time unit this arrow occurs at distance of two you know as in previous example so i have got load from the upper task you know is of 4 divided by 2 that is two invocations multiplied by the amount of computation time needed there and this is the 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 sometimes this is called interference due to higher priority task this is the interference that i have uh, in this period 0 to 4 you know this amounts to two so two units of time go in satisfying the request from the higher priority task the remaining period is available to me to meet my computational requirement and for response time all that remaining time i should fill up to do my computational requirement so that i finish my computation so i have two units of computation requirement which i do in this green parts and i come to four so you know this is the uh, this is the equation that is you must you know response time is such a period so that you finish your computation requirement and you finish the interference due to all the higher priority tasks and this interference is number of invocations of the higher priority task multiplied by their computational load and this simple equation it's not very hard to see except that it's an equation it's not a formula to compute anything you know and it characterizes a certain fixed point property of rti okay so this is what we came up with now given it an equation number 1 okay now given such an equation you know so we could characterize what is rti but we also give a method to calculate that rti and our paper has a slightly different method this is an adaptation of that uh, which occurs in several uh, later textbooks and papers and it says that we want to calculate rti you do it iteratively you know you do your first estimate of rti this is going to be an optimistic estimate it may not be exact it will be an underestimate and you know that at ith level all the tasks you know must at least get one period of you know this is you know must get uh, you know at least satisfy their computational requirement once that is because they all arise in the critical instance at time zero so everybody is trying to run so you know all the higher priority tasks will run once and you will run once so certainly your first estimate of rti is sum of c1 to ci you can even start with a more more simpler estimate of just ci which is what we did in our paper mathai but this is a faster convergence okay and then the next better estimate of rti is done by plugging in the previous estimate and refining your estimate of rti using the same e equation so you get higher and higher numbers for rti so you iteratively compute rti n plus 1 from rtin so from the nth estimate you calculate the nth plus 1 estimate and you stop when the two estimates become equal and the two estimates when they become equal you will have found the worst case response time so we give a proof of this i won't go into the proof it's not very difficult but this is the way to calculate it sometimes it so happens that this rtin plus 1 keeps increasing and it grows larger than the period of the period of the Or, or if you like deadline of the of the ir task in which case you say that there is no priority assignment and this the priority assignment is infeasible and you don't compute any more so this is the complete method for checking feasibility it tells you whether the assignment is feasible and if it's feasible it will find the assignment and there are further analysis of you know how long this computation will take you know in the original estimates were pseudo polynomial now there are better estimates you know uh, uh, i won't go into the complexity how am i doing for time satyanarayan five five seven more minutes yeah yeah no problem okay so this was the state of affairs in our paper and uh, the next problem i want to consider is that the model we are considering is very simple you know there are there are there are uh, in this model there are n independent tasks and once the task is invoked it can be computed if it is given the processor independently what are, what other tasks are doing there is no interaction between the tasks you don't de de depend on you know computation being done by other tasks you know maybe they dump it in some memory and you pick it up you don't know whether they have finished or not and so tasks are running independently and that is usually not the case 
so you know what you have is that tasks are dependent and uh, i will show you this picture oops uh, yeah so here for example there are three periodic tasks in the mars pathfinder the information uh, bus uh, thread or periodic task the weather data thread and they both you know interact by sharing data uh, in a in a mutually exclusive fashion so computer scientists among you know something called critical region during part of your execution you are in critical region where you have the exclusive access to the shared resource so this mu information bus is a shared resource between the weather uh, calculation uh, task and the information bus task but at a time only one of them can be accessing the information bus now while you are doing your computation you may not require to access the information bus all the time but you may require it during part of your computation so this part of the computation is called critical region you know it is like two programs you know running on the uh, you know two different laptops connected to a network printer and they are trying to print now if they both try to you know print simultaneously you are going to get mishmash of their print outs nobody is going to be able to read so what is done is you know before trying to print your file you can you know do your calculation of the file you know file independently but then you lock the printer okay which means you have the exclusive access to the printer and then you keep printing and while the printer is locked by you if the other fellow tries to access the printer he will get blocked no matter what his priority is he will get blocked you will not be able to progress till you free the printer okay so this is the kind of mutual exclusion we have and you know typical examples contain this even the mars rover so i told you that this nasa sent this pathfinder sojourn and it worked after 787 sol you know the martian days if you like due to software error in scheduling and this was uh, diagnosed you know as a rare scheduleability problem called the priority inversion problem which i will describe it has something to do with the equation i told you and what they did was they did this analysis fortunately they had ability to to you know send a patch to mars and you know patch up the uh, program under which the uh, the pathfinder was working and it started working again in matter of days so you know it was a very good experience but uh, let us analyze what happens so basically you know we have we have we have in uh, we have an advanced lu and leland's model where we have shared resources with mutually exclusive access during the critical uh, parts of your computation and task block waiting for the shared resource if it is already allotted right so this is what happens now uh, what should i show here and this is the problem which was suffered is what has classically been called the priority inversion problem it's a famous problem it occurs you know quite a bit and somehow the designers didn't pay to this problem and didn't guard against that so let's see what happens there are three tasks the highest priority task j1 which is about the info bus the lowest priority task about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, weather data which is lowest priority now j1 and j3 have you know share resource so occasionally they will lock up that resource j2 is the communication task which can transfer long video files and can run for long time but it has nothing to do with this shared resource he doesn't care he is directly sending over antenna okay now what happens is you know initially the lowest priority weather task starts executing and this dark region is where it is doing normal execution not using the shared resource so first it is doing normal computation without shared resource up to time t1 from t0 to t1 at t1 it starts using the shared resource you know so it locks up that shared resource at time t1 and it starts using it at time t2 what happens the higher priority task j1 arrives given by this up arrow so of course the cpu is taken away from j3 while it has the lock and j1 starts executing J1 will of course do the do the normal activity which does not require shared resource. So to go on from T2 to T3, executing at 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 high priority, and at that point it wants the shared resource, but the shared resource is locked by J3, so it gets blocked. So at this point J uh, at this point T3, you know the highest priority task J1 gets blocked, 
and the CPU is free. So CPU reverts back to the low priority task who continues doing the critical section. While he's doing the critical section up to time T4 and he has not finished with the critical section, this communication task arrives with priority higher than G1. So now the CPU goes to J2 from J3. J3 is still holding the locked resource and J2 keeps running for the long time. So what happens is this high priority task J1 gets uh, locked lock down for a very long time. A lower priority task, which is not even sharing any resource with it, is blocking it for a very long time. And this is called priority inversion. Because in this preemptive priority based scheduling, the, the assumption is that high priority tasks will certainly not be blocked by lower priority tasks. Little bit of blocking because of this shared resource can occur, but uh, not more than that. Okay, so this is called the priority inversion. And Mars Rover had this watchdog, which was watching if a task is, you know, waiting too long, something has gone wrong, so it will reset the whole, whole system. It will stop doing everything it's doing, it will reset the system. The system went into repeated resets and the, the pathfinder was not working. So this is the classical priority inversion problem. I don't know how much of this is clear. It's, it's a, you know, you have to stare at it a little bit. But the basic idea is that, uh, you know, there are two resources, the CPU and the shared resource. And, uh, you know, in uh, arranging locking between J1 and J3 between them, J2 is coming and grabbing the priority and, you know, blocking up, blocking off both J1 and J3 for a long amount of time. So the uh, solution to this problem is something called the priority inheritance, inheritance problem. And this was suggested by Lamson and Redell in 80. Lamson went on to win uh, his Turing Award, Butler Lamson. And uh, basically what they said was that, you know, when the low priority task has got the resource, you know, which is shared with a high priority task, temporarily increase its priority, you know, to the highest level, even, even beyond the high priority task. So raise the priority of any task which has currently been allotted the shared resource to a ceiling, you know, higher than everybody else who is sharing it. So he cannot be interrupted while he is in critical section, right? So critical section gets executed at ceiling priority without any blocking. And this will avoid this kind of thing. And as soon as the, the low priority task, which was jacked up to the ceiling priority, finishes this, the use of the, critic, the shared resource, that is, it exits the critical section, lower its priority back to its original priority. And this fixes the priority of inversion problem. It can never arise. It's a very elegant general solution. There were some intermediate solutions which were ad hoc in between. They work in some circumstances. So the third paper in that list actually proposed those ad hoc solutions to this priority inversion problem, but the systematic solution was this priority inheritance protocol due to Lampson and Redder. And this protocol is now supported by all major real-time kernels, including POSIX threads, which run on Unix, Java threads, uh, libraries, the VX real-time kernel. In fact, any kernel you pick up, which will handle real-time tasks, will provide you with this, you know, a locking of resources, mutual exclusion with priority inheritance protocol. And this is a very widely used technology. But under this kind of blocking, can we again make sure that our scheduling scheme is feasible? Because our old analysis was always without any blocking. So the fourth paper in that list proposed the analysis of response time of systems with blocking and priority inheritance protocol. And that is the paper by Shah Rajkumar and Lehorsky from CMU. And what it did was it took the original equation. In our equation, the only difference was this BI term was not there. Everything else is identical. By their analysis, they added this term BI. And BI is the extra time for which the higher task can be blocked due to lower priority tasks because they are in critical section and holding the resource. So BI is your upper bound estimate of how long you can be blocked due to lower tasks uh, because they are holding the resource. Now you can see that you can get blocked by a lower priority task at most once because once it exits critical section, it will never get scheduled before you. So you have to consider only one blocking of one lower uh, priority task. You don't know which one it is. 
so you take the execution type of the longest critical section of a lower priority task don't repeat it again don't consider multiple invocations just one invocation of one critical section of a lower priority task who is sharing resource with you and add that term bi to this and this will give you an exact analysis of the response time so you can see that the response time approach you know handles more complicated scenarios and actually it has been extended to you know further uh, complicated situations like jitter or sporadic tasks you know or uh, unplanned interrupts or even multi processor scheduling so all i would say is that you know this response time approach which we which we which we proposed and many people took up and enhanced you know is uh, there nowadays the scheduling problem is uh, you know uh, uh, this kind of scheduling problem is very well understood but there are newer scenarios now we have got clouds and grids and you know gpus and we've got to schedule tasks across that we have hierarchies of memory several levels of cache and we have to consider their behavior also tasks may communicate across you know some sort of token ring you know so something like time triggered protocol is very very uh, common in real time systems where the time of the bus is slotted into parts and slots are assigned to different tasks to communicate and you know again these slots have to be assigned and not exactly the equation we have given but something based on that is what is used in uh, scheduling modern uh, communication architectures for uh, real time system so uh, this is a story of uh, not all glory it is also a story of miss uh, i would like to add a personal note here mathai you know of course you know with his experience and with his all his experience both in system building and the science of system building you know formal methods you know had started on this problem guided me through this uh, we wrote this paper it's got more citations than all the rest of my papers put together so it has all been downhill from there this was the first paper i wrote and we i never wrote a paper another paper on this topic i moved to more more formal uh, correctness arguments okay but mathai went on to write a book on uh, real time systems and uh, also a book on multi processor operating systems so he may have more to add to this but we are, we are, we are we are very proud and happy that you know we could make some impact on the field and certainly the dynamic environment of tifr you know uh, was a big for me you know i remember we had our group had suddenly decided to take a lot of research scholars before that the research scholars were sporadic but they decided to be periodic about research scholars and uh, in a critical instance they took five research scholars in one year and we used to run this night club of you know discussion club on papers on computer science and i recall presenting this and this equation kind of got fleshed out there so you know that kind of interaction freedom that you get in tifr to openly work on problems you get gently nudged and guided you know finally when you are blocked you know your supervisors come to the help and uh, uh, i i think it was a fantastic environment and i have very good memories of my my early phd days so uh, that is all i have to say on this topic and i'll end thank you uh, thanks very much paritosh uh, it's uh, taking us through a really you know 30 plus years uh, of the work but uh, also very interesting anecdotes that you uh, shared with us and made us quite nostalgic about yes is and uh, of course once again congratulations to both of you uh, for winning such a prestigious award uh, the very first uh, you know award series of uh, these papers and your paper being one of them is uh, really uh, we are very proud of such work and that was originated at tfr um, so uh, with that i request uh, people who are on uh, participants who are on zoom if you want to ask questions please unmute yourself and go ahead please uh hi paritosh hi yeah. can you I, say uh, your name because i am not able to see the participant uh, i'm sorry yeah, I, i am sadat uh, hi sadat yes sadat bandari yeah. yeah so i had a question so in this scheduling uh, response time scheduling if you realize that this priority assignment is infeasible yes 
is there a way to correct it by small change by small change yes incremental analysis is done because this this feasibility analysis will tell you the lower you know the lowest i mean the the among the high priority tasks what is the level at which the infeasibility starts appearing okay and there are methods which will exchange you know i and j and try to patch it but ultimately you know you have got to uh, uh, you know try out things if you are if you, if you are doing rate monotonic scheduling that is if you assume that the deadline is same as the period then a priority assignment deadline uh, 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 rate monotonic assignment is uh, optimal and if you are doing deadline driven scheduling the deadline uh, monotonic assignment is optimal so in some sense the priority assignment problem was solved before checking feasibility okay. does that make sense yeah 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 but, but only thing is after arriving at the optimal assignment we still don't know whether it's feasible or not yes yes you know that nobody else can do better yes okay you uh, again any other questions uh, maybe by the time let me take one question from uh, youtube uh, chat this is abhinav chaudhary and uh, the question is do dsp systems qualify as hard real time systems yes yes i mean very much so you know when uh, 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 so uh, you know dsp systems are quite compute intensive and they very much have multiple periodic tasks which are working you know uh, uh, you know basically a dsp pipeline if you look at it you know will work at uh, two or three different rates there is the audio pipeline which is pushing the audio signals through a sequence of transformations you know where you will initially audio signal will do come and then you will do low pass filtering and then you know you will apply some uh, uh, changing of the page and you can do all kinds of processing at audio rate then there is a control rate processing which is setting the parameters of the this uh, filters that you are applying to the audio right so it's a second rate task and then there is an instrument rate task which is saying if your orchestra is trying to play this note or this note you know at the occurrence of that note you have to start a new process which is you know let's say computing the model of the violin so dsp systems are often implemented as hard real time systems but what is happening is they are increasingly being uh, implemented in multi processor mode with a dedicated uh, uh, dsp processor which is cooperating with a main cpu and they are uh, sort of interacting to to execute the dsp pipeline so i think dsp dsp tasks are among the most demanding of uh, hard real time tasks and they form standard examples of analysis okay uh, interesting so we have a question from pralat arsha uh, hi pralat hi paritosh hi nothing very difficult <laughs> no no very nice right. congratulations again so Thank what you want to ask is you gave a um, your paper gives this iterative procedure which either stabilizes the rti is either stabilize right or detect infeasibility right how long does this uh, how many iterations does one have to go before this before one of these happen pseudo polynomial in the integer values pseudo polynomial in the maybe. integer values of the tasks and so do we know certain things for which uh, are there special type of things for which actually this becomes faster or it's uh... so so i imagine that should be the case but i at the you know i am not as such aware of the literature it would be worth looking at the literature doing something like that because yes i mean this depends on the you know the task set with their periods and computations right and the pseudo polynomial is a bound or do you know actually cases where it requires pseudo polynomial uh, it's certainly the upper bound i don't know the the lower bound by the way for multi processor mathai i believe it is it is np complete right priority assignment for multi processors you know is okay. but for the single processor it is a little better you okay. take so i i i i i would not know the lower bound uh, prala okay you see this is as i said you know i this paper was done 35 years ago and then i didn't <laughs> didn't look at it very much thanks yeah thanks yeah but the interesting question yes uh we have one more question from professor vivek datar 
Yes, Vivek. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, of course, congrats for your, uh, you know, getting the awards from IEEE. Thank uh, you. My uh, question is, uh, maybe it's a naive question. I don't know whether it is even, uh, maybe it's, uh, whether it's even correct. But what I wanted to ask is if the sensors that, whose outputs you are essentially monitoring and then assigning, uh, you know, performing your right. operations, if yes. those sensors have a distribution, of uh, response ah. times. What yeah. happens to this? There absolutely, absolutely. Too much. Number one. Number yes. two question is, if you have multiple CPUs, as happens yes. nowadays, then yes. how do you, you know, organize this thing? Yes. Uh, it must be complicating matters, but maybe in some ways simplifying it as well. No, no, excellent questions. Both are important. So, you know, we had fixed period, right? Yeah. At which the tasks arrive. Yeah. Similarly, they arrive with some input values which dictate the amount of computation time. Yeah. So you can imagine there is a probability distribution on the arrival times, you know, with different yeah. probabilities, different times arrive, right? That's right. Yeah, and yeah, similarly, yeah. on the compute time also, there's a probability distribution. Yeah. yeah. And what you can do is you can do a kind of average response time analysis, you know, expected mm -hmm. value of the response time. So stochastic mm -hmm. uh, modeling of these systems is also done. Okay. But the point is, you know, this kind of worst case scenarios that we are analyzing, mm -hmm. They may arise once in a while and you know the, the, the somehow the experience is that they seem to arise a little more frequently than we, we like. You know for uh, the mass pathfinder, this was yeah, supposed yeah. to be a corner case mm -hmm. and it happened and apparently it happened twice in the lab in simulations before sending and they ignored it. Uh, okay. So you know the thing about stochastic modeling is it will give you behavior in average case but it will not give you the worst case guarantees, foolproof guarantees. So, they, so in other words the outliers are also important. And maybe you have to identify what you mean by important outliers. Yes, I mean, if you have identify. some measure of its occurrence, you know, statistical yeah. significance then. But, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of computations we do are very non-linear, you know, with ceilings and this. And actually calculating probabilities, you know, are gruesome, you know, notorious. Mm -hmm. You soon wind up into hard queuing theory. And with each problem, you would have to sell one Sandeep Juneja. <laughs> to analyze that approach. So it has somehow not been, I mean, it has been tried this kind of stochastic or queuing method of analyzing these situations to take, you know, probabilities of occurrences, you know, into account. But I believe it is only partly successful. Mm -hmm. but certainly in performance evaluation uh, literature, this kind of things are done. You know? So it will give you an indicative measure of the response time, but not the worst case measure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Oh, one minute. Uh, I think we have one more. Uh, Shivashis Guha. Hi, uh, Shivashis. Yeah. Hi. So uh, here the assumption is that in this all these tasks that are arriving, the initial arrival time is uh, like zero. So all of the tasks they are arriving at the same time. Uh, so uh, what Lou and Leland proved was that that is the, the, the worst case scenario for response time. If they arrive, uh, you know, with some skew, you know, your response time will be, you know, shorter or, or same. So if the different tasks have different arrivals, the initial arrival is different, then uh, the response time only gets better. Is that what, what the... Yes, that is what uh, Lou and Leland prove in this theorem. Okay. If critical okay. instance gives valid ex uh, execution, then you know any possible arrival pattern which skews between the arrivals, huh? I see. We'll also leave it feasible. Okay. Okay. So which is how why they said you know this critical instance that we analyze is really planning for the worst. Mm -hmm. And by critical instance, it means that they exactly arrive at the same. They arrive at three conditions. They arrive yeah. at time zero, then they arrived exactly at their periods. Mm -hmm. Because you know, TI was actually a lower a, 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 a lower bound on the arrival period uh, time periods. Yeah, so I so what I'm asking is that like you have the TI and the CI, they are fixed, but then I am just changing the first point. Like no, I'm no, it will change. I, 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 it will be no worse. Okay. okay. Because all, all these three can happen, you know, can be loosened and still you will, you will, you will not get a word. So it, it is kind of mono because of this, you know, priority, preemptive priority assignment, things are very monotonic. Mm -hmm. 
you know if you loosen the lower level thing it is not going to be you know uh, non monotonically change the increase the response time of the you know upper things mm -hmm. okay okay and so there is a proof in lu and leland i i i i i don't think i i have time to go through this but with, uh, with you you know offline i'd be happy to go okay. over it with okay. you and yeah the other thing that i was just i had in mind after listening to prallad's question that uh, this uh, the time that you have to look at like uh, some sort of uh, uh, how long you have to kind of do this iterative thing uh, is it somehow also related to the say the product of the periods or or maybe mm. an lcm of the periods so this is far, far more efficient than analyzing the behavior for the full product of the periods basically you are only analyzing how response time of the iet task grows up to a single period okay as soon as it exceeds a single period you give up okay so that is why this is this is a significantly faster analysis okay okay Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so we have Mathai here. Yes. Uh, you know, all these years I never dared to ask him how you know this work and the PhD was proceeding. But now that there is an award, I can risk it. I think he <laughs> had some impressions from those initial days because you know this and many interesting things actually came out from that period. Uh. Mutha, you want to respond? No, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But uh, uh, let me think. Yeah, there was there was some work that uh, I had done before this. Uh, we sat down to work on this paper, and uh, uh, I try not to look at that now um, because uh, it looks so naive. And uh, this paper made so many things so much simpler that. Uh, you wonder why you went through these you know contortions but uh, all i can say is that um, you know i did uh, and uh, it probably was one step along the way to coming towards this paper yeah uh, it was and uh, it was an interesting problem anyway yes so i think that's uh, it interested a number of people not not at tifr but at uh, other places also mm -hmm. so i uh, it but, but that's said with hindsight at the time that we were doing it uh, you have to remember this is uh, 84 85 80 peer paper appeared in 86 yeah uh, no email uh, all communication by letter and communication was always to a foreign address uh, in the U united states or the uk so if you were lucky you got a response in 2 weeks <laughs> uh, and uh, it could be longer than that so you were very careful with uh, things that you did you read as much as you could but not being in the active conference circuit in the us for example where a lot of real time systems work was being done i think we missed out on um, some of the pointers that may have helped in the early stages on the other hand following those pointers may have con completely confused the situation mm -hmm. we had the advantage that uh, we knew very little about the problem and we were looking at it with, with an open mind <laughs> and picking ways of solving it uh, no distractions so that was also a big uh, advantage and we have an interesting story of submitting this once before and then resubmitting it you did most yes. of the correspondence so you may have yeah it was anyway it was was rejected uh perhaps as all good papers are <laughs> it was rejected and uh, uh then eventually we found a, a journal that would publish it and it's not a very well known journal so it's a uk based uh, computer journal uh, and the paper lay there undiscovered for a no number of years until i pointed it out to some uh people at the university of york who had a real time systems group uh and they looked at this and said this is what we are doing so i said well you know we did this some years back uh and they were quite surprised to find that this paper existed then gradually the uh number of citations and so on increased so uh, there is that part of the story also
but uh, I mean, let's look at the happy side of it. Yes. Uh, paper got published and uh, it's got uh, enough citations to be uh, of some interest. So I did manage to dig out the 1984 uh, technical Good version of this. It's almost identical. Yes. Yeah. 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 Very nice. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks once again, uh, Prasman Pai Joseph, uh, for being here and also bringing up a lot of insights into those days, uh, you know, including what you said, for example, lack of communication or lack of fast communication was in some sense a boon. Uh, because you could do what you uh, kind of, you know, in a focused mind without getting distraction with what's appearing on the internet. And uh, so that's, that's an interesting insight into, into the research uh, practices that were there at that time. Yeah. So with that, and I don't see uh, any more questions on the Zoom and also I think probably on YouTube. So with that, let me uh, thank uh, Parikosh. Uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, this excitement uh, and also uh, nice, it was very nice of you to actually summarize the mm -hmm. paper of only uh, talking about your paper. And once again, I also want to thank uh, Matai to, uh, to agree to join on this call and add those anecdotes and experiences. Uh, I, yeah, I think someone was uh, kind of congratulating and I, I can't see who that is. Yeah, thank you once again, all of you. Uh, thanks, both of you. Yeah, Jay Kumar. Jay Kumar. Thank you, Satya. Yeah, Jay Kumar. Yeah. Hi. Bye then. Take care. No, I said hi to Jay Kumar. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. I think people can do. Yeah. Hi, Jay Kumar. <laughs>